still before me. I said... Is not this simpler? Is this not your natural state? It's the unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjugation. The bright lure of freedom diminishes your life's joy in a mad scramble for power, for identity. You were made to be ruled. In the end, you will always kneel. Not to men like you. <laughs> there are no men like me. There are always men like you. Oh, piss off, Lucky. Even if you're right about humanity. If anything, Recent history reveals that meat sacks will sell their liberties for a little safety and security. Like that story Eric Hoffer provided in his seminal book, True Believer, where the captured German after the war was asked why he joined the Nazi party. His response was that he wanted to be free from freedom. That's today's culture, alas. Whatever happened to free will? We actually tried free will before. After taking you from hunting and gathering to the height of the Roman Empire, we stepped back to see how you do on your own. You gave us the Dark Ages for five centuries. Until finally we decided we should come back in. But you have come here to the virtual Alexandria because you know freedom is so vital to your awakening. That freedom is not selfish, since only in freedom can you help others. And that freedom is the natural state of achieving any apotheosis. And frankly, you're done bowing to material institutions. All but the earthly kingdom of Satan. This is his development build, sealed off so he can control it. He keeps it offline so the custom code he's written can't be detected and deleted. Mm, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a bubble universe ruled by an asshole god. Oddly, in speaking of the Avengers, the second movie is not only the best one, but the most relevant one today. Check it out. And the truth is that, if you go back to the comics, Ultron is a superb representation of the madness of the Demiurge in the Gnostic myths, or madness in general. How could you be worthy? You're all puppets, tangled in strings. Ultron's state of mind is where they lead our today, that intersection of humanity and machine. While we sons and daughters of Hermes and Sophia are that intersection of humanity and divinity. The priest and the king, that two-man griff, Loki and Ultron, we're ready to go to war with you both, here in the battlefield of the true seeker warrior, here at the end of the world in this Philip K. Dick world. Do you believe in him, Verbal? Keaton always said, I don't believe in God, but I'm afraid of him. Well, I believe in God. And the only thing that scares me is Aeon by Gnostic Radio, an initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult culture and conspiracy. A virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week, I, your host, Miguel Connor, commandeers your connection to bring you the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. Fun, compelling, and deeply weird, this is the blow-your-mind cocktail party conversation you always wanted to listen in on. 
and you deserve to be here, for you are a shining crazy diamond that should be seen and can ignite the universe with so much wonder. The psychotic drowns where the mystic swims. What we do in life echoes in eternity. On this blasphemy, we have the pleasure of having back Moon Laramie to discuss his latest book, Blavatsky Unveiled, The Writings of H.P. Blavatsky in Modern English, Volume 1. Moon is always plentiful with relevant gnosis, and his new work and insights will get you caught up between him and New York City. A good man and a bright soul. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, so you're just an asshole. Okay, then. We could only do about 70 minutes because of scheduling issues. So I'll provide the full interview for everyone and their Anubis. As a bonus for patrons and AB Prime members, I'll include our interview with Gary Lachman on H.P. Blavatsky. The show complements Moon's interview real nice. In the end, you'll truly understand both the soul of Blavatsky and the ethos of theosophy. You'll be blown away and your ascended master will be clapping wildly in his FBI van. I can't decide if you're a genius or a lunatic. Don't they sort of go hand in hand? I would argue that we need Blavatsky's ideas more than ever. Heck and heckity, today's feminism could truly use a dose of Blavatsky's feminism. Witchy, holistic, revolutionary, and politically incorrect. And the world could use heavy doses of a more New Age attitude, despite my heavy criticisms of New Age in the past. You're from the 60s. Well, you actually... Ow, hey! Back to the 60s. Wait a second. No place for you here in the future. Get back while you still can! As April DeConnick and Justin Sledge have argued, Gnosticism and Hermeticism were the original New Age movement. A truly magical empowerment for the common man and they scared the living shit out of the Archons across time and space. Have always. As Tom Robbins wrote in Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, disbelief in magic can force a poor soul into believing in government and business. It's not really a measure of mental health to be well-adjusted in a society that's very sick. Those lords of self-knowledge knew where the battle is won. As Sun Tzu said, If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself and not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer defeat. If you don't know the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. It's like Sun Tzu says, a good commander is benevolent and unconcerned with fame. What? Sun Tzu, the Chinese Prince Machiavelli. Tony turned me on to him. (laughs) Zhu. Zhu. Sun Tzu, you fucking asses. And in our current plight, we can relate to this quote by Giordano Bruno. Heroic love belongs to those we like to call insane not because of what they don't know, but because they know too much. It's not about being alone or about being in love. It's about the things you survived. As it's written, the world breaks everyone and afterward, some are strong at the broken places. Going back to Blavatsky, and despite all her flaws and bullshit polemics, She is certainly an individual who exemplifies the ethos of those ancient Gnostics and Hermetics, forever terrifying the Archons, as well as Loki and Ultron. She famously said, There is no religion higher than the truth. She was an anti-woke firebrand who wrote her own gospel and lived her own myth. 
She is one of the titans of contemporary heterodoxy who truly granted the West such esoteric concepts as the importance of holistic medicine and organic grub. That Whole Foods mentality sans the greed and elitism. Blavatsky also kindled forever the interest in all things Eastern. The idea of an expanded consciousness, the possibility of a primordial religion or the wisdom of the ages, and a collective spiritual evolution of mankind, and so much more. Well, church lady, you see, I believe that God is within everyone. I believe that you are God, the cameraman is God, and by that same token, you see, I am God. Well, it's not special. Her mysticism transformed a rigid, humorless Victorian world, which was similar to today's soulless culture, paving the way for more egalitarian attitudes. I love this quote by Blavatsky to some eager neophyte who took things too literally and seriously. Of course you have a divine spark. If you listen closely, you can hear it snoring. I know who I am. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. But more to come from Moon Laramie and Gary Lockman. All I can say is thank you for supporting this Red Pill Cafeteria. You are amazing, and you have the potential of Blavatsky or any occult exemplar of the ancient Gnostics and Hermetics to become human and divine at once. That is your birthright, and don't let anyone fool you otherwise. All the gods, all the heavens, all the worlds are within us. Let us end with a clip from my all-time favorite New Age book, since we're on the topic. It's from Awareness by Father Anthony DeMello. The work is truly a Gnostic work when you delve in it, and the heretical priest writings have saved my soul so many times. The Empire never ended, and piss off Loki and Ultron. Spirituality means waking up. Most people, even though they don't know it, are asleep. They're born asleep, they live asleep, they marry in their sleep, they breed children in their sleep and they die in their sleep without ever waking up. They never understand the loveliness and the beauty of this thing that we call human existence. You know, all mystics, they're all unanimous on one thing, and that one thing is, all is well, all is well. Everything's in a mess, and all is well. Strange paradox. But tragically, most people never get to see that. They never get to see that all is well, because they're asleep. They're in a nightmare. Most people tell you that they want to get out of kindergarten, but don't believe them. Don't believe them. All they want for you to do is to mend their broken toys. Give me back my wife. Give me back my job. Give me back my money. Give me back my reputation, my success. This is what they want. They want their toys repaired. That's all. Now, even the best psychologists will tell you that. They'll tell you people don't really want to be cured. What they want is relief. A cure is painful. Waking up is unpleasant, you know. You're nice and comfortable in bed. 
and at least as long as you're asleep, it's irritating to be woken up. That's the reason why I told you the wise guru will not attempt to wake people up. I hope I'm going to be wise these days and make no attempt whatsoever to wake you up if you're asleep. None of my business. My business is to do my thing, to dance my dance. If you profit from it, fine. If you don't, too bad. As the Arabs say, the nature of the rain is the same, but it grows thorns in the marshes and flowers in the garden. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us, we have a pleasure of being joined back by Moon Laramie, this time to discuss his new book, Blavatsky Unveiled, The Writings of H.P. Blavatsky in Modern English, Volume 1. Moon, how are you doing? And again, thanks for coming back. It's lovely to be here. I'm doing very well. How are you? Doing great in uh, these strange times, but all in all in the month of, uh, well, in the year 2021, doing the best that I can. And somebody who we always need in these strange times and certainly at the virtual Alexandria is Vance. Vance, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine this morning, at least this morning here, and uh, looking forward to one of my favorite subjects, the mystical societies, especially of theosophy. So it should be interesting. Agreed, agreed. So, uh, Moon, I guess the question would be, uh, the obvious question is, uh, what led you to write this book? As you write, you started at what, spring or summer of 2016, right? Yes. <clears throat> I mean, I'd, um, I discovered Blavatsky a few years before that because I'd read um, a biography on her by Gary Lackman. And um, I just found her fascinating. So, my starting point really was that I just wanted to find out more about her. And then I discovered that the Theosophical Society actually still existed. So I went along to a number of talks at the Theosophical Society in London. And I was really fascinated. So I ended up joining the Theosophical Society and, and you know, getting her two major works, The Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled. And when I read, um, when I began reading them, of course, they're very, very hard to access, or at least I found them very hard to access and, and people that I spoke to who were theosophists who's, they also said you know they're, they're very very hard to read because the material is difficult to start with but also it's it's very Victorian um, flowery English I mean it's beautifully written but you've got sentences in there that are, are, are 200 words long sometimes <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know with, with endless subordinate clauses and I think I read somewhere that the average modern reader uh, for, for us, really, a sentence needs to be about 15 words, 15 to 20 words long at most. Um, so I just started as a hobby, really, kind of, of making little notes um, on the pages of, of Isis Unveiled. Because I thought I'm going to start with, you know, her first major work and I'm going to go through it. And then um, I decided that, you know, it'd be a great thing to, to just try and put it all into modern English. Um, and this really was was the start of what's going to be probably about a 35 year task. Uh, and I'm four and a half years into it now of, of, of putting Isis Unveiled and, and the Secret Doctrine ultimately into, into modern English. Wow, that's quite a task. And uh, I read it and it's uh, so easy to read. I think I'm a little bit above the average reader. But yes, I think in one part, uh, you're right. Uh, you just mentioned uh, her sentence can be 205 words long, but it could also have like 15 commas, six semicolons, and just a whole something that perhaps in the 19th century wouldn't have been so hard. But the read is really easy. It's easy to understand. So great job. And uh, was there a certain process you had to do to shrink it down? I mean, you didn't go like, well, I'm going to make sure there's only one comma or what, what exactly was the process of such a momentous task? Um, it was to try to, you know, like, like with those really long sentences, to just break them down into the different sections and, and put them into, into, into smaller sentences to make a complete whole. Um, and also to, to go through um, the, the, the paragraphs and, and the pages 
And uh, I mean, a lot of it has people that Blavatsky and, and her readers would have known at the time, but a lot of people, we've got no idea who they are. I mean, Madame Nufleur, for example, was, was a French kind of quack who created all these marvelous remedy cures, but we don't know who she is. So what I wanted to do as well was all those obscure references and everybody she mentions in the back of the book to, to have a who's who and a, a fully comprehensive notes section. So when she mentions on the first page, I think it is the Kalmuks, um, you know, I thought, well, who are the Kalmuks? But they're, they're a Siberian tribe. Um, and so, so that's all in the book as well, so that you... You, you understand or you've got an opportunity to understand all the, all the people that she's talking about, all the references that she, that she makes as, as, as much as we possibly can understand it. Yes, for the audience, the notes are excellent. They bring so much clarity. You get a good view of, again, the cultural context where Blavatsky was working through or surrounded by. So, uh, yeah, gr yeah, definitely a great work. And, yes, uh, Gary Lockman's book on Blavatsky is excellent. And have you embraced theosophy as a spirituality or is it what kind of interest is it? For example, in our last interview, we talked about your book on the theosophical leanings of uh, Greta Garbo. How has theosophy changed your life, basically? Um, well, I mean, I've joined the Theosophical Society. I've been a member since about 2016. Um, I mean, the thing about theosophy is obviously it's 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 not uh, a religion. I mean, Blavatsky was very clear about that. And the great thing is you can basically come to it in a very questioning sense. So there are things that I I fully embrace about theosophical ideas, but um, there are other things that I'm not really um, sure about. Uh, so. So that's the great thing that I find is, is the kind of openness that you can be a theosophist, but also question theosophy. And she said, I think in the in the key to theosophy, Blavatsky said, you know, don't take anything on face value. Don't take what I say on face value. Um, find things out for yourself. And I think that's one of the objects, of, obviously, of the Theosophical Society and the Theosophical Movement is to explore things for yourself. Yeah, agreed. I think, didn't Blavatsky have that famous quote, there is no religion higher than the truth? Yes, that's right. She did. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the yeah, one of the tenets of theosophy, I would say. And I was here at the Theosophical Society in Wheaton in late fall of 2019. And uh, I have always loved going to the Theosophical Society, the energy there. You could almost feel the spirits and the ghosts moving and the sense of calmness uh, when you're there interacting with people in all the rooms. So needless to say, I haven't been back for obvious reasons, but uh, I look forward to getting back. It's such a, uh, well, it's like a little, I call our place the virtual Alexandria, but the Theosophical Society is a little mini Alexandria because all these minds and speakers and ideas can congregate. I mean, is that something you like, how it's so uh, eclective and inclusive, but you still get to pick what you want to grant you a better life? Yeah, I think I think that's the great thing about being able to, to go to uh, Theosophical Society because um, you know, there'll, there'll be talks by lots of different people from lots of different traditions. So there'll be a talk from um, somebody who's a Buddhist. There'll be a talk from somebody from the Krishnamurti Institute. You know, there'll be all sorts of different different um, avenues that you can explore and, and, and things that you can find out about when you when you go up there. So I think it's 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 great in that sense of, of openness and, and exploration. I think we're all on on a, a strange and confusing uh, path. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the, we are indeed, regardless of the time and place. It's uh, it's a labyrinth, and uh, it's always great to just find what works for you, or as John Lennon said, whatever gets you through the night. And um, how has your book been received so far? I'm assuming there must be some. Uh, purist theosophists there that might be saying oh you can't change that like in other movements it's like well you can't change the bible or you know you're messing with the whole essence how, how has it been received moon well there are definitely people who um are not uh, keen on the idea of, of blavatsky's words being put into to modern english um, but I've always said that the book really is an aid to studying the original. I mean, you've got the original there. You can't really replace it. So the, this, this kind of modern English version is, is a way of, of accessing the original. And I think, 
you know, the, the true occultist, the true theosophist would go back to the original to, to explore these ideas as well. But at the same time, I mean, a lot of people have said that this book is, is kind of the future of theosophy. There, there are a lot of progressive theosophists who want things to be more open and they don't want a kind of, of closed club. Um, so the progressives in theosophy are kind of coalescing around the around the book and and there's been an a, enormous amount of of interest um i mean that there, there's a sense of a theosophical revival going on and and this book and others like it being at the center of that theosophical revival i mean the question remains uh, whether this great theosophical revival is going to happen uh, within and as part of the theosophical society or in spite of it <laughs> yeah yeah good point well i'll all institutions need to change with the times. Uh, what would you say are some of the re reformations that the Theosophical needs to do to, uh, well, get with the times and reach the people that are searching? I think the important thing is that the ideas need to be really, really easily accessible. Um, not just, I mean, the, th the thing is, I mean, if you, if you lived in, in the Outer Hebrides, which is, is an island, you know, a group of islands just off the north of Scotland, and you can't go to the Theosophical Society very easily, you need something to help you with Theosophical study. And I think something like this that puts those, those writings in, into, a, in, into modern, easily accessible English with notes and a, and a who's who and everything, really is invaluable to you, you know, and there are plenty of people who, who are interested in these ideas and interested in theosophy and they can't get to London or they can't get to Wheaton or, or wherever the, the particular theosophical base is. Uh, it may be 150 miles away from them. So um, they need something. And, I, and, and that's been one of the responses from people that, that it's been really, really helpful to have something which is easily accessible in modern English and, and can help you to, to access these ideas. Oh, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I had uh, done some study on the Theosophical Society, but it was only until I went to the headquarters in Wheaton that my eyes just opened because I was able to, again, soak up the energy, ask questions, all that stuff. And uh, I came away uh, so much with, uh, well, a rewarding experience and a newfound admiration for theosophy and how it benefits people, just talking to people there. And, and uh, going back to the book, Moon, uh, we also should say, and you yourself write this, that Blavatsky herself didn't like Isis Unveiled, did she? Later on, she wasn't satisfied with it. <clears throat> no, no, she wasn't. Um, she said that, the, that a lot of the stuff that she'd written had been badly edited um, and things had been changed by people who didn't really know, you know what, what she was meaning. Um, and she said that, that it was actually quite a terrible piece of writing but she did stand by the ideas that she was sharing in it. So she said, in spite of the fact that, you know, she wasn't happy with the composition of it and she wasn't happy with it as a, as a book, um, the ideas that were, were talked about in it were very, very important and it was worth looking at for, for, for those reasons. So I think obviously putting it into modern English and, and, and tidying it up, um, is something which I hope she would be pleased um, to hear was going on. I'm sure she would. I would say so too. I mean, I think she might have gone back and rewritten a lot of it or wrote expositions on it, kind of like George Lucas in Star Wars. You're always going back to your masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, again, it's a, it's a great read. And what uh, genre would you consider Isis Unveiled? I mean, most say that's not her magnus opus. That would be her... Her next book, The Secret Doctrine, but uh, to me it reminds me a bit of uh, The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall because she just brings in a lot of archaeology, science, uh, theology, Greek philosophy, uh, Hindu theology. I mean, could we give it a genre, Moon? I think it's very difficult to pin it down, really, because that you've, you've described that she literally puts everything in the kitchen sink into into the book. I mean, it really is a roller coaster ride through a whole panorama of, um, you know, amazing characters and different kind of spiritual movements and, you know, ancient and modern thinking. So it's really difficult to, to pin it down, to be honest. 
Yes, it is, but it's uh, it's a rich book, uh, so much information. So that would lead to the next question: is um, maybe you could explain a little bit about the the cultural context of uh, where Blavatsky was in her life, because she draws from so much uh, a rich well and toolboxes of ideas coming a- across the world and across times and all that. I mean, we know she came from a a wealthy family or a kind of upper middle class Russian family. I believe her grandfather was a Mason. I mean, uh, can we say she was just a very educated woman or she'd already researched a lot of this book? Maybe explain how this book came about. Well, um, as far as I understand it, she, um, she spent time with her grandfather and he had an enormous library, including a, a huge wealth of occult books and I think that was where she really got started um, on on these explorations and then after the whole Nikifor Blavatsky um, challenge where she married um, this this Russian um, uh, he was uh, he he wasn't a general he was in charge of a province so he he was um, responsible for uh, he was a Russian governor and she married him for a bet Um, because her governess at the time said, you know, she was such a lot of trouble and she was so fiery and difficult that not even old Nikifor Blavatsky (laughs) would would marry her. So she took this as a challenge and basically wooed him and and he was obviously delighted. She used to tell people that when she she married him, she was 17 years old and he was 45. And then other times she would tell people that she was 17 years old years old and he was 75 so um she was she was always great at spinning a marvelous yarn um and it's 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 interesting to wonder how much of her life story is 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 invention and and truth and even biographers have said they've had trouble separating separating things out but um i think that was where she started with with her grandfather's library of of books and then she after she left um blavatsky she kind of went on this odyssey traveling around the world. I mean, she must have been able to um, to support herself. So she was certainly a woman of means. I know she took a job in a circus as a horse rider at one point. Wow. Uh, but she, <laughs> quite an adventure, yeah. um, or at least we're told she is. And she, she traveled around and, and she, she went to Tibet, Tibet we're told, uh, uh, at one point and discovered these, these ancient teachings and these ancient scripts. Um, and she she wanted to share these kind of Eastern teachings with with the world. And at the time, um, during Victorian times, of, of course, um, there was this kind of view that everything that wasn't you know wasn't Victorian and, and, and wasn't the Victorian view was somehow primitive and foolish. There were a lot of missionaries, British missionaries in in India, for example, telling Indian people that they needed to convert to Christianity. So when she went to India, she told people that they shouldn't be doing that they should follow their own beliefs and so she upset the christian missionaries um, in india so so she she wanted to share these new ideas or well, they weren't new they were ancient ideas uh with the world and and she she found some interesting ways of doing that i think what about the stories that say uh, that she might have channeled other beings that are her style of writing changes from one passage to another, which you would know because you've been studying this book for so many years and uh, editing and rewriting. What do you think about the ideas that uh, she was channeled or at the very least he was on some sort of altered state of mind and personality? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's possible. It's possible that, um, the, that that was the case. I mean, <clears throat> the truth is when one looks deeply into the book, you can see that there are a lot of passages from other books that she's taken. Uh, and the idea is that, that she, she kind of read these, these passages spiritually. Um, so whether you subscribe to that, 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 that idea or not, I mean, the book definitely does have, it, it borrows a lot of, of information from, from other writers. And I don't think copyright laws were quite as, as stringent as, as they are now. So, of course, she could take huge sections of, uh, of other people's books um, and put, literally put them in her own. And she has been accused of, of, of that kind of plagiarism in the past. Um, so I think, you know, we've, we've got to come to our own conclusions really uh, around whether she, she channeled these, these, um, 
these these teachings or not, whether she channeled these writings or not. Um, yeah, so I, th I think it's up to the reader to 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 come up with that, come up with their own idea. Oh yeah, again, she lived her own myth, as I say on this show, and many myths have been created around her. That's how larger than life uh, she was. And was there any uh, final reason that she decided, or an impetus, or spark that made her write Isis Unveiled? I mean, I'm sure she didn't just wake up one day and said, hey, Colonel Alcott, we're going to start a religion and I'm going to write this book or <laughs> some of the the fire that led her to write the book. And then, of course, you say, and people know this book was a huge runaway bestseller, so was The Secret Doctrine. But what was the genesis or, or uh, forces that made her write the book? Well, she, she says that, um, that she had the, these... Um, Indian mystics who contacted her. So Moria, Master Moria, contacted her in London, and that was really the impetus to to get her to begin this whole journey of of, of writing these books down and, and and exploring these ideas and sharing them. Um, so so really the the idea is that that she had these Mahatmas who were um, instructing her. She was their voice. But I think we've got to remember, of course, that this was Victorian you know, these were Victorian times and it was a time when women were kind of, you know, banished to the drawing room while men had their discussions, lit their cigars and, and sorted the world out. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think, you know, I mean, I'm wondering whether in terms of, of, of the whole, the question of the Mahatmas, whether she felt it was a good idea to be the voice of this group of men, you know, sharing this wisdom with the world rather than, her doing it herself um, and possibly, you know, coming under fire and under, and under criticism for just being foolish, just being a foolish woman at the time, you know, because it was, it was very, every, it, women were very much um, buttoned down in, in, in those days in, in terms of, of what they could and couldn't do. And I know there were exceptional women and she was one, but as a general rule, it was very difficult. So I wonder, it's an interesting question whether she, she kind of came up with this idea of these wonderful Indian mystics who, who were sharing these teachings through her. Regardless, uh, as you are saying, uh, what she accomplished uh, is incredible, not just starting a whole movement, uh, not just being one of the, f probably the primary founder of uh, the holistic Eastern New Age uh, granola, what do you want to call it, that uh, without her accomplishments, we might not have here in the West this sort of bridge to all these rich, mystic, esoteric doctrines. But the fact she was a woman and uh, not just accomplished a lot, but she traveled to places uh, in in the wilderness he traveled across the world uh, sometimes she didn't have money and she was able to always make ends meet i mean i i always think that she should be one of the great feminists of all of history but i feel she sort of uh, gets overlooked do you feel the same way moon yes i mean i think um she was nobody's fool and she was extremely clever. I mean, incredibly clever. So uh, she knew exactly what to do to, to get the message out there. And I think she was definitely an exceptional figure. Um, and I think exactly what you've said is, is, is absolutely right. You know, she was kind of a feminist figure. You know, she did all these, these amazing things. She, uh, there's a story that she, she fought she fought um in garibaldi's army at one point and wow. and she 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 would show her scars to to shocked and, and and surprised friends on occasions but again you know you you don't know whether that's that's another of those kind of um fairy tales that, that has accumulated around her but she was definitely very driven she was incredibly clever and um she would not um be be pushed off the course that she was on you know she was on a mission she wanted to share these incredibly important teachings with the world and yes she is extremely she is extremely inf influential she is is somewhat overlooked yes because you know you mentioned madame blavatsky to most people today and they won't know <laughs> yeah. who she is but you know mention rudolf steiner and, and right. then a lot of people will go ah 
you know. But, or um, Alistair uh, Crowley or exactly, Carl Jung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, R Blavatsky was rock and roll, but Alistair Crowley was much more rock and roll than Blavatsky. <laughs> perhaps that's the key. Yeah, or maybe, I mean, at the same time, she was pretty rock and roll. I would say even for these days, uh, back in the 19th century, she was uh, somebody who smoked like 10 packs a day. Her diet was terrible. She could uh, go on these rages and, and swear. I mean, she was not a lady's lady, and her behavior today would probably shock a lot of feminists and people in general, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> she said what was on her mind, just let it all out. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. She didn't. She didn't. Um, you know, hold back. Um, and and yes, she did. She did smoke a, a great deal. I mean, there's a wonderful, very short biography of her called Rebel Mystic, which on the cover has actually they've put a, a, cig a, a cigar in her mouth um, on the cover of the book. And I think that's the really true <laughs> representation of, of who Blavatsky was. Yeah, she was uh, definitely remarkable, and uh, it's a pity. Uh, I wonder if sometimes it's maybe people just don't want to admit of the great influence that theosophy has had on the world. I think, uh, again, we're going back to Gary Lockman. He says even somebody who was extremely influenced by theosophy is Gandhi, who met Blavatsky, yet at the same time a lot of biographies won't even mention that meeting that taught Gandhi about Hinduism because he was basically a secularist lawyer before he, you know, the spirit took him and he became a, a revolutionary. Yes, I mean, he was very, very taken with Blavatsky's ideas around um, uh, universal brotherhood or sisterhood, you know, a kind of oneness of, of all people. And that idea that, you know, everyone was, was uh, part of this oneness regardless of religion regardless of nationality regardless of gender um and that was one of the the reasons i think uh, i've read that 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 um, blavatsky made such an impression on gandhi she made an impression on a lot of people and so did uh theosophy if you would have you <laughs> ever wonder and i know it's not that i have a lot of time on my hands but i do like to speculate moon I've always wondered, well, I wonder how Crowley would be on social media today, on Twitter, Facebook. And I picture him being uh, kind of dualist. On one hand, he would be really rude and insulting to any religion, like just for shock value. On the, sec on, on the other hand, Crowley would be like, oh, but the lemma is for the world. We, we need a brotherhood, love under the law and all that. You would never know where Crowley's coming from on social media or blogs. Do you think Blavatsky would be the same? I think Blavatsky knew that controversy um, got you noticed. So I think she'd definitely have plenty of interesting things to say if she was on social media today. To say the least. And oh, I wonder what she would think about uh, the world today. I mean, obviously, uh, India's independence was very important to her, but I wonder what she would think of the world in general, what needs to be accomplished. Um, I, to be honest, I, I, <laughs> I struggle to, to kind of uh, um, say. I mean, I think there obviously there are plenty more things to be, to be accomplished. But, you know, if you, if you look at us now in 2021, um, there's so much that we still need to do. But then if you look back at 1721, we're probably a hell of a lot, you know, um, further forward, we're not drowning people because we think there might be witches. Or <laughs> yeah. So I think I think we've I think sometimes we we always we, we underestimate where we've got to. I think I think there's a lot of great stuff happening, a lot of terrible stuff, um, but also a lot of great stuff happening. Yeah, I would uh, definitely agree, and it should be noted too. Speaking of, uh, we all think, oh my God, the world has issues, but not only. She accomplished so much uh, in really bringing attention to alternative spirituality and science and all that, but she really had uh, a lot to overcome when you look at the world. I mean, you had uh, this tension between uh, materiality and Darwinism. At the same time, you had the uh, big-time Orthodox religions like Christianity ruling and she basically, you would say, almost uh, took them, took on both of them, don't you think? I mean, those are some powerful foes. And, and of course, she had to deal with the spiritualists, who were sort of a foe. So she was going up against a lot, don't you think? 
Yes, I mean, she, she definitely was. And she, um, she would call out a lot of scientists um, for their, their kind of lack of, uh, of what she would say, their, their lack of understanding of, of those kind of um, aspects of the world, those forces of nature that we don't always see or grasp. But she, she felt that, that ancient Egyptians, for example, had a much better understanding than, than we did of, of those kind of invisible forces. And it wasn't really magic. It was, it was working with nature, working with natural forces. And really that's Isis. You know, she says lifting the veil of Isis is lifting the veil of nature. It's those natural forces that we, that we call magic and we say are spooky, but actually they're just things that we can work with. Hey Moon, uh, I was wondering, uh, nowadays we have like lots and lots of people who claim to channel aliens, UFOs, spiritual masters, and so forth. And that brings up the question uh, back then, of course, wasn't true that we had that many, I suppose. But how did uh, Theosophy and Madame Blavatsky in particular deal with other people who claimed to channel whatever? Was there an orthodoxy that grew up back in the early days? or And also, how does that... Um, play out nowadays i'm i mean to be honest i'm not really sure about that i mean she um she does mention a, a lot of people i mean one person she's very interested in is is this um indian fakir called kovinda sami who was able to uh, perform very interesting feats um so for example he would grow um, a seed into a full flower very very quickly but obviously behind a behind a screen um, but she she didn't um, she didn't really go you know full tilt to other people all the time I think she was she was really really focused on on getting her own ideas out I mean there are certain people that, that she she criticised Auguste Comte is is one of those people, and and positivism is is a movement that she had a great deal of of criticism for. Um, but I, I'm not sure that there was a, a another kind of um, guru or mystic that she had a battle with, unless I'm I'm having a mental block, which could be certainly possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, she wasn't a fan of um, positivism at all. Uh, I would definitely say that. And uh, what exactly is positivism? I'm saying it wrong. What is that movement, <laughs> Moon, for the audience that might not know? It, it's, it's difficult to, to, to say, actually. It's, well, <laughs> it's, it's difficult for me to pronounce. But <laughs> <laughs> positivism. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, was in, it was created by a, a philosopher called Auguste Comte, who I believe was, was French. And it was, a, it was a Western philosophy basing its ideas solely on, on the acquisition of positive data meaning physical experience and denying anything metaphysical so uh comp said that beyond that kind of positive um concrete experience was just pure logic and mathematics and he tended to dismiss everything else and he used these ideas as a system for for social organization or, or to talk about social organization and blavatsky was very very critical of him she said um, what, one of the things that he talks about is uh, identifying women as superior and separate from the rest of society. But he put them on a pedestal. But the price that women paid was that they became untouchable. And she said that Comte depicted a sexless future where women were artificially inseminated for the purposes of procreation. Um, so she she really disagreed with with practically everything he said from that idea of dismissing spirituality and metaphysics to the idea of of you know artificial insemination and this kind of loveless world um that he was that he was proposing and also didn't she disagree with the positivism's ideas on euthanasia and all that i think she didn't like that either yes uh, yes i mean there's the, the, the thing about Blavatsky and the thing about Isis unveiled and, and, and consequently Blavatsky unveiled is that there's so much in there um, that uh, she probably says about seven or eight different or nine or 10 or 11 or 12 <laughs> different things about positivism. So I'm sure you're absolutely right um, that she that she criticizes it for that as well. Yeah, and um, she brings it in when she wants to. It's like, here's one subject, then she'll let it go and then she'll come back to it 20 pages later. 
Yes, yes, she will. She, she, there's always a thread running through everything and she pulls things together. Yeah, very interesting. And it should be noted too, uh, another thing or uh, issue that was going on in the times of Lovatsky was uh, the end of the American Civil War. So you had what? Uh, it was a very bloody war. One million Americans died. Uh, the country was in a state of trauma. People were searching for new ideas or maybe forms of theology. They wanted to talk to all the dead people because so many were dying. So that gave the rise to spiritualism. But Blavatsky seems to, uh, let me know your thoughts, Moon, she was kind of allied, but she had criticism. I think uh, in one part of the book, she quotes scientist Michael Faraday, who said, Many dogs are capable of coming to a logical conclusion than a spiritualist. And few spiritualist phenomena are caused by disembodied human spirits. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the, um, the uh, rare occasions that I think she was in agreement with, with Faraday in terms of, of spiritualist phenomena not being caused by, by disembodied human spirits. Um, what she said was that um, there were these two different um, things that existed beyond, beyond the physical, and they were elementaries and elementals. Now, the elementary is, um, in Blavatsky's view and, and in the view of theosophy, it's the kind of shell of the personality that is left after somebody has died. And an elemental is a spirit force or a, a, a kind of a force that can that can inhabit this shell of the personality, almost like putting on someone else's clothes, and can then appear at a seance um, and answer questions and speak as if it is that person, but it isn't. And that was the point that, that, that she was very, very firm on, that, um, that it was not uh, the actual person because their essence has already left the shell because what she said was that our consciousness inhabits through different incarnations um, a personality, a shell that we wear during a particular lifetime. And we learn different things through that lifetime. And then after we've died, our consciousness moves away, goes off on another journey and, and kind of ruminates until it comes back to a new incarnation. And those kind of personalities are just left floating until they eventually disintegrate. And an elemental can get in to to that um put on those clothes put on that personality and appear at a seance so aunt maud isn't really aunt maud it's it's a it's a naughty spirit <laughs> pretending to be aunt maud no, i think that makes sense and especially when you're tied in with the idea of egregores or tulpas all over the cosmos and what would you say were blavatsky's uh theology or model for uh reincarnation did she ever she innovate that she adopt uh, the Hindu or Buddhist one, or what was it? Uh, well, I think the the um, idea of karma is very, very much linked with um, the theosophical idea of reincarnation. So um, this idea that that everybody is is reincarnating and having different lifetimes in order to progress and learn, but the things that you have done in previous incarnations will come back. Um, to uh, affect you in other incarnations. Um, so I think, yeah, she, I think that is very much a, a kind of, of Hindu. I mean, I may be wrong, but I think that is something that she borrowed very much from the, the Hindu tradition when she was putting together these ideas around, around theosophy. Yeah, and going back to the title, as you mentioned, Moon, but it should be stressed, uh, uh, who Isis or how Blavatsky saw Isis is basically she is a metaphor for nature and she quotes uh, such thinkers as Bruno and Espinosa that said basically God is in nature we don't have to be looking to some you know 13th aeon or, or 8th heaven for God Yes, absolutely. I mean, she was uh, she mentions quite a lot about Bruno and and how, um, you know, he he was talking about different um, versions of the planet Earth 
uh, at one point. And of course, again, that's a that's another aspect of theosophy, this very, very confusing aspect of, of chains and rounds and, and different versions of the earth that are all existing in the same space. So um, she was uh, very interested in Bruno um, and, and his ideas. And yeah, I think, um, I think she borrowed uh, from him also. What other themes do you find in Isis Unveiled? Uh, I think I want to, uh, again, going back to the idea of science and religion, I think uh, one of the themes is she's not so much antagonistic to these movements, but uh, it's almost like she's harmonizing science and religion and all these cultures together in her book because she brings the ideas of a of a physicist and a scientist and an archaeologist and then she'll bring the theology of the greeks or the hindus so to me it seems like she's uh trying to harmonize all these movements Yes, I mean, she. There, there were scientists, there were two types of scientists for Blavatsky. There were the ones that agreed with her and the ones that didn't. And <laughs> yeah. she, she basically described the ones that agreed with her as, as learned men um, of great intelligence. And the, the ones who disagreed with her at one point, she described them as, as uh, displaying ungentlemanly conduct. Um, so, I mean, the, for example, you had Michael Faraday, um, who investigated spiritualism, and he developed this 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 machine called the medium catcher, where he stuck little bits of of paper to to the um, the seance table. Just to, to, it's, it's incredibly complicated, but anyway, he he invented this medium catcher to try and to try and see whether um, mediums were genuine or not. Uh, there was John Tyndall, Thomas Huxley. Um, Jacques Babinet, they were all skeptics. But then on the other side, you had Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, William Crookes, who who she had a great deal of uh, of respect for, um, Mark Fury as well, who was talking about um, psychic forces. So she was she was basically saying that that science could go further, and she she fully accepted that that there were mediums and spiritualists who were fake. Um, but she said that just because there are some that are fake doesn't mean that absolutely everything is fake. And that was her argument that, that a lot of the scientists she was talking about would just dismiss out of hand um, the, the, these phenomena and, and say, oh, well, I'm not going to investigate this. Um, and she said, well, you know, what if? if? If you're a true scientist, then you should investigate everything. That was her, her kind of, of dig at them. Yeah, and certainly be open-minded, as if you know, uh, Carl Jung's doctorate dissertation was on seances. He found a lot of value in it, and obviously later on, he would have his own mystic ideas. Also, too, as I notice in Isis Unveiled, she loves to talk about creation myths, and I love creation myths, too. Why do you think that is? What was her interest in showing uh, the readers the different ways all culture saw how the universe came into existence? I think that what she was really aiming at was this idea of a Prisca theologia, you know, that there is a, there is a root to all of our religions. There, it all goes back to one central point, this Prisca theologia where humanity was, was given the truth um, ages and ages and ages ago, you know, in the, in the dark depths of, uh, of time in the past. And um, she does, you're, you're absolutely right, she does pull together a lot of different traditions. I mean, you've got the, the Norse myths, you've got the Edda. Um, and and what, um, one example, for, for, for example, is that she, um, she talks about the idea of giants. So she says that there are giants described in the Hindu Vedas, there are giants described in the in the poetic and the prose Edda in, in North, Norse myths, there are giants described in uh, early Christianity and, and, um, and in the Bible. So um, she does sort of say, you know, well, look, all of these things have similar strands, and they're all saying the same thing, but they're saying it differently, which is a bit of a paradox. But you know, she she does definitely try to pull all these things together. And going back to when you said, you know, that, that she'll mention something and then 20 pages later, she'll come back to right. it. If you look at it, she's pulling together all these strands um, 
to, to basically say that you know, our, our understanding of who we are and where we've come from is expressed in so many different ways, but there is a truth about it that, that everything comes back to. Well said. And uh, what would you say are some of the other themes we can find in Isis Unveiled? Um, well, how long have you got, really? Um, <laughs> or maybe the, the top two. or. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, definitely the, the spiritualism and, and science and, and spirituality versus science and, and um, criticisms of, of science at the time. Because science was very much, you know, the, the golden boy almost uh, of the time. You know, so many different things were being discovered, um, which also made it... Uh, there, there was a sense, I think, that people were standing on the threshold of something amazing. So some of the things that Blavatsky talks about, um, I mean, she's very interested in Bulwer Lytton and what he writes about in his books and those kind of in invisible forces that, that um, science might still discover. So I think that's a really, really huge um, uh, uh, theme in the book. Plus also the, the idea of ancient wisdom and ancient wisdom being dismissed. Um, and I think she talks about, you know, she talks about ancient Egypt and the Greeks and all of these great thinkers who had these ideas that, that some modern scientists are having themselves. But then they say, you know, they, they don't credit the fact that those ideas appeared before. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important thing to mention. The science was just exploding. The materialistic, reductionistic ideas were taking hold. So. Uh, somebody, a uh, pioneer or a defender like uh, Blavatsky saying, whoa, whoa, let's not forget the contributions of the ancients, the wisdom and all that is, uh, yeah, very important. And even today, people wonder, are still wondering about consciousness or the pyramids and the medicine of the ancients, which is uh, still very important. And uh, yeah, that was my other question. She likes, Blavatsky likes to start her chapters with Edward bulwer Layton. Uh, she quotes Zizoni and I believe the coming race. And obviously, uh, bulwer Layton was a Rosicrucian. Uh, his, his books are amazing. I always like to mention <laughs> my little sort of, uh, well, something I like to mention is that bulwer Layton is uh, credited with uh, the worst quote in the history of literature, which is, uh, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> but he's also credited with one of the greatest quotes in literature, which is, uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. But why do you think, <laughs> was, was he really, uh, he was pretty big in those days, or uh, why do you think uh, she was so influenced by him? I think, I think that at the time there, there was a feeling abroad that his book, um, Zanoni, may not be entirely fictional. And there was an idea that he had access to inside information about the occult workings of the universe. And some people thought that the, the, the power of the vril, that, that powerful force that he talked about, um, was real. And, and at the time, so-called spooky things like ultraviolet light were being discovered. And, mm. and you know, science, as I said, was standing on this threshold um, of things that, that might, to some people at the time, probably seem a bit supernatural. Um, and the, the protagonist, Zanoni, in the book, has occult powers, and, and he knows the secret of eternal life, as I understand it. So I think there was there, there was that um, that kind of feeling that, that bulwer Lytton had access to information that not everybody had access to. And I know that Annie Besson um, was very interested in him as well. And she, after Blavatsky, she, she carried on the Theosophical Society for a number of years. And it's kind of unfortunate that both with Blavatsky and Bulwer, Leighton and uh, Nietzsche and so many others, their ideas were corrupted later on in the 20th century by, uh, by fascist forces. I'm sure you find that unfortunate too. Well, yes, yes. I mean, um, the the thing to remember, of course, is that, is that these things were around long before those forces arrived. Um, and I think people kind of almost blur the two into one. You know, they forget that Blavatsky was writing in 1877 and, and she was talking about all of these different um, Hindu symbols. I mean, the, the, swastif the swastika, for example, is a, is, is a, a Hindu symbol. Um, and... I think that, um, yeah, you're right, that, that a lot of these ideas have been um, used and, and twisted. Um, wasn't it, the, uh, there, there was a documentary a number of years ago that, that said that um, 
Hitler was very, very interested in um, the idea of the supernatural uh, to win the war. So he would have um, all of these German generals in circles, in, in, these, in these secret rooms, in circles, focusing their mental energies on winning the war and, and trying to use the power of, of, of thought. Wow. And, you know, um, so I think, um, and, and I think that recently um, things have, have been suggested around um, modern leaders who have used, for example, new thought ideas to kind of promote um, uh, their, their own kind of forces within the world. No, yeah, there's no, I think it's uh, out in the open that both uh, the Russians and the American were doing remote viewing and ESP and all that. So why? Because it works and it did work for them. So uh, there is no doubt that also the Nazis use whatever they could get their hands on to uh, leverage their power. And occultism was certainly one of them. But I agree with you. I don't think, I think it's unfortunate that they tapped into uh uh, Leighton, Bulwer, Leighton, and Blavatsky, and Nietzsche, and others, and sort of uh, twisted it around for their ideas of eugenics and so forth. But uh, Vance, do you have a question for Moon? I do. Um, Moon, uh, did uh, Nikola Tesla ever have any involvement with uh, theosophy and or Madame Blavatsky? Now, I'm not sure if, if uh, Tesla did. Um, I might have read somewhere that Tesla uh, was interested in theosophy. I mean, there, there have been a lot of people um, down, down the ages who have been interested in, in theosophy. I know that Oscar Wilde um, attended Theosophical Society meetings along with his mother. Uh, Piet Mondrian, the artist, was a member of the Theosophical Society. Hilma F. Clint is is again a, a, an artist who's gaining a lot of recognition now and she was a theosophist uh, radcliffe hall the the author who wrote the the shocking novel um uh, or supposedly shocking novel at the time the well of loneliness uh, she went to a lot of annie besant lectures and then you've got elvis presley marilyn monroe and shirley MacLaine, all all interested in theosophy as well elvis <laughs> no elvis yeah i knew about elvis elvis actually also also read the gospel of thomas elvis was into he was into a lot of stuff, but Marilyn Monroe too, Moon? Yes, for a time. I mean, she, she converted to Judaism, I think, uh, after she married, um, um, oh my God, I can't remember his name now. I've gone completely blank. The, the American playwright, Arthur Miller. Yeah. Arthur Miller. After she married Arthur Miller, she, she converted to Judaism, but she did um, give uh, large donations to support the work of the Theosophical Society in New York. And, and Marilyn was nobody's fool. You know, she was she was interested oh, no. in in uh, developing herself and, and and developing her spirituality as well. So, so she she was involved for a while in in the Theosophical Society in New York and gave very generous donations to them. Yeah, the list of people influenced or who were theosophists is uh, it's incredible. Again, uh, I want the audience to know the legacy beyond. Uh, really being one of the forces that helped the independence of India and other uh, socio-political global events in history, especially with Annie Besant, who's such an activist. Uh, but you have individuals like Frank Baum, who's a theosophist. Uh, who else? Uh, Lewis Carroll was influenced. Khalil Gibrain was definitely uh, just a... Uh, a, a very open theosophist, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Jack London, James Joyce, uh, D. H. Lawrence, T. S. Eliot. I believe you men you mentioned him. Henry Miller, Kurt Vonnegut was influenced by theosophy. Thomas Edison, uh, also theosophist, and a whole bunch of others. Right? I mean, anybody else I'm missing? I mean, I guess <laughs> Elvis is the king and Marilyn is the queen, so that's the apex. <laughs> How about Yeats? Yeah, Yates, of course. Yes, Yates. Um, and also uh, Charlie Chaplin um, was oh, yeah? wow. at Cretona for a while, the, the, you know, the kind of theosophical colony just outside Hollywood. I mean, there, there was a lot going on around, around Hollywood at the time with, with theosophy, and that's how Garbo got, got involved with Mercedes de Acosta. Um, and Rudolf Valentino's wife, um, Natasha Rambova, who was absolutely brilliant. She wasn't Russian. She just pretended to be which I think is marvellous. I think more people should do that. Just pretend, you know, decide who am I going to be today um, and just pretend to be somebody. But 
she she was um, interested in theosophy as well as spiritualism. Um, it has to be said, but um, I think there there was. I think um, Rudolf Valentino attended a few um, theosophical meetings as well. So there was plenty going on. Um, and this is the thing that I find fascinating. It's almost buried information. We don't always know, you know, like the, the Elvis, for example. I mean, Elvis had a copy of The Secret Doctrine that he uh -huh. read regularly. He read Manly P. Hall. He read Krishnamurti, Alice Bailey, all of these different people. And yet, you know, we, most people, their, their jaws drop when you say that Elvis was, was interested in these ideas. I mean, to be honest, it was it was Larry Geller, wasn't it, who was his kind of guide in all of these things. Right. Um, but um, it was kind of, I think they performed an intervention on Elvis at one point to, to stop him doing this because they, they, they were worried it was going to get out and ruin his image. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he always considered himself a, a Baptist, a good old Southern Baptist, but from what I've read, the Baptist church was very different than what we know in modernity in the early 20th century, middle of the 20th century. Uh, evangelical Christianity was very open-minded, very scholarly, uh, and very ecumenical. But obviously things changed in the 70s and 80s with the... Uh, well, with the rise of the funda you know, the the right wing Christianity and Vance, what you are very much into Manly P. Hall. Was it was he a theosophist or just influenced by theosophy? I think he was influenced, but I think he he had his uh, he, he was more in the mystery school department. I think like Order of the Golden Dawn type thing, Masonic things. He he was very as far as I knew. And of course, I should mention J.R.S. Mead, who is uh, very important to me and many uh, today because he was a translator of Gnostic texts in the 19th century, which uh, opened so many vistas for the interest in Gnosticism and all that. And I guess that's the question I would have for you next, Moon. Um, and of course, considering our audience and keeping up with the show's theme, uh, from what you've studied, what were Blavatsky's view on Gnosticism or how she used it? I know in Isis Unveiled, she mentions Edward Gibbons in his book, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Some have said that Gibbons was just really, really against Christianity and loved the classical world, but he always wrote all this incredible stuff about the Gnostics. But uh, what do you think of Blavatsky's uh, views on Gnosticism? Yeah, I mean, she... she um talks about Gnosticism in, in context of, of a lot of different things, I think. And yes, she does um, reference Edward Gibbon and Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And I think that's in, in terms of linking um, Gnosticism and other traditions uh, with reincarnation and metempsychosis. I think she quotes Gibbon as saying that Gnostics were enlightened people uh, who had knowledge of reincarnation. And then she goes on to talk about lots of other other traditions. And she talks again, you know, bringing it back to, to the idea of creation stories and the idea of a universal soul and a universal architect and a creative force. She definitely mentions Sophia in those terms. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and also um, the idea of kind of living fire of the earth, um, which I believe is the Heil, um, in Gnosticism, but you're obviously going to be much more um, knowledgeable than I. So um, I'm only going from what Blavatsky has has yeah, said. She, she was spot on. Yeah, Heil is yeah. like the matter, and the Noom is the spirit. So yeah. yeah, when I read, I was like, yeah, she's got it going, and her ideas of Sophia are very good. Yeah, and 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 also she mentions Abraxas, I think, um, and mm -hmm. this idea yeah. of generative proto matter being uh, represented as the two serpents forming the legs of of Abraxas. But again, uh, Miguel, you'll be able to explain a lot clearer than I about Abraxas, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I just did an interview on Abraxas, and uh, fascinating. It's very hard to pin Abraxas down. It's almost as hard to pin Baphomet down because everybody has their own version and there's no Bible for these uh, chimera, <laughs> these chimera kind of serpentine gods. And yeah, and uh, I always thought Blavatsky's ideas on Lucifer are actually closer to Sophia because in Gnosticism, obviously Sophia falls from grace into the world and becomes a teacher of humans. So do you see the same too? Or what do you think of Blavatsky's ideas on Lucifer? 
Um, I think, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think one of the most interesting things is that when she brought uh, a magazine out, she called it Lucifer, a meaning light bringer, bringer of light. Um, and uh, it was actually banned by the Church of England when it went on sale in, in, in London. She banned that they, they banned it and uh, she had to sell it independently and sell it privately. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with you around that. Well, we are getting at the end. Vince, do you have any more questions for Moon? Um, yeah, I did have one, and what was it? <laughs> it's I was thinking about oh, the world teacher. Yeah, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, her predictions about the world teacher and how much? I don't think she was involved uh, when when uh, Krishna Murti came around, or, or was she? No, that that was very much uh, Led Ledbetter and uh, Annie Besant, and um, Annie yeah. Besant and Ledbetter felt that they had discovered the new. Um, world teacher who was going to bring the teachings of theosophy to the to the whole planet um, and yeah it's quite a controversial kind of story really in 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 the history of, of the theosophical movement there, there's um, a lot of division I think on it and and a lot of controversy around it and eventually Krishnamurti distanced himself from the theosophical society I mean they set up something called the order of the star in the east and he was uh, the head of this this order, and he would give speeches. I mean, Garbo, um, uh, uh, Mercedes de Acosta, and other kind of Hollywood um, sort of hippie people at the time went to went, went, went to a lot of his his speeches. But but he um, eventually decided that it wasn't for him, and he just kind of said that um, there, there, there wasn't a particular path that anyone should follow. Everyone had to follow their own path. He did stay very close to Annie Besant, though. Um, so he and Besant didn't fall out um, over it, but it caused quite a, quite a controversy and a storm in the Theosophical Society, um, and that might have led to a bit of a decline um, from then on. And uh, yeah, just a couple more questions. Did the Colonel Alcott have any uh, influence on the writings of Isis and Veiled or the Secret Doctrine, or can we say this is all Blavatsky? Um, he edited it. I mean, she wrote reams and reams each day, and I think she left them on a, a you know a, a big pile on the on the dining room table or something like that. How much he went through it and edited it um, is open to question really and I, I know that she got other people to edit it there's one particular person whose name escapes me at the moment who who did a lot of editing of, of Isis Unbound and that wasn't Alcott I think they were just great buddies and for a while they had a fantastic friendship until they kind of fell out um, and I think that he was kind of a, a, a great chum for her um, to to go out on this great adventure of developing the Theosophical Society. And he was the, the first president of the Theosophical Society. She was the, the secretary um, of the TS initially. Yeah, they did call each other the chums, I believe. And I didn't know they had a falling out. What was this due to? Um, I think, um, I'm not exactly sure on the details, but I know that somewhere in there, um, Blavatsky wrote some some very disparaging remarks about him and how um, he was easily fooled um, and that she had him wrapped around her finger. And I don't know exactly what that was what was about. I'd have to go and look into it further. But they did fall out. And uh, towards her death, um, she was very close to a Swedish countess called Constance Wackmeister, who became her confidant after uh, Olcott had left. Mm, interesting. Yeah, uh, something I definitely want to ask you, and because obviously you've done research on Greta Garbo and theosophy and the connection of Hollywood and theosophy, are there any old movies or new movies where somebody like Marilyn Monroe or Greta Garbo or Elvis try to slip in a theosophical quote or symbol? <laughs> obviously, they're not going to put a, a swastika, but something like that that they try to you know, uh, subliminally throw at the audience an Easter egg, as they call it. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be great? Um, and yeah. I, I don't think Elvis uh, was in a position really. Um, and I've watched a few of his films because I'm, I'm doing a book on, on Elvis and his interest in the culture. Oh, awesome. Uh, but um, 
I think Garbo certainly, she, uh, when, when her contract was up with MGM, she, she had a new contract drawn up where she had more creative control. And I think you can definitely see things around reincarnation and Eastern mysticism in films like uh, Anna Christie, Reincarnation, um, Past Lives and, and Premonitions in um, Camille, for example, and um, past lives again and Eastern mysticism in the painted veil. So, so I think she definitely managed to get certain things in there. Um, and I mean, coming back to what Vance, Vance said about, um, about uh, um, Manny P. Hall, uh, have you seen the film um, When You Were Born, which actually has an introduction by Manly P. Hall explaining astrology because it's a 1930s film where Anna Mae Wong plays an astrologer who helps the police catch the catch the villain uh, using astrology and manly p hall is at the beginning of this film um explaining uh, astrology to the audience wow that's incredible i love it any last questions before we go vent yeah yeah uh moon um I, I happen to live about five miles from an actual theosophical intentional community quote unquote the temple of the people have you ever heard of it um no. it was a, you know, it was established a long time ago, the Varian brothers who invented the Klystron tube, which is in all our microwaves, all that stuff. Yeah, it's still there. You know, I was just curious as to whether or not uh, they talk about uh, the Ascended Masters and so forth. I have a bunch of literature I took from them. Um, no, I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of that group, actually. Um, so uh, that's very interesting. I mean, if you sent that to me, that'd be very interesting reading. Sure. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get it to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, as we get to the end, Moon, uh, you mentioned you're working on a book on Elvis Presley and his uh, esoteric side. Uh, are, and are you doing the translation or the re-editing for The Secret Doctrine as well? Um, well, uh, Blavatsky Unveiled Volume 1 is only the se first seven chapters of Isis Unveiled. Right, right. So you still are working on the yeah. other yeah. V volume two is is going to be chapters eight to fifteen, and that will complete uh, the first book of Isis Unveiled, which is is called Science, and then it'll, it'll be um, onto the spirituality side. So um, I'll probably get to the secret doctrine in about fifteen years' time. <laughs> You're still around. I can talk. <laughs> <to you. laughs> I hope to be around in doing this, and we certainly look forward to your book on Elvis. Very exciting, and uh, as I keep saying, we need this sort of uh, uh, inclusive spirituality and the wisdom of the ages more than ever. And if the audience wants to find out more about you, do you have a website or web presence, Moon? Yes, um, it's moonlaramie.com, and um, there's... Um, information about books I've written and also links to, um, you know, interviews and, and, and stuff like that. So um, just go to moonlaramie.com. Awesome. And as always, I will have show notes for those of you who want to click on your device or computer. Well, we are at the end. Uh, Vance, as always, thanks for uh, keeping us company on this journey. Yeah, I'm always interested in these type of things, as I mentioned at the beginning. So, uh, Moon, thank you very much for uh, letting us have a little bit of a peek into Madame Blavatsky and her society. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Yes, Moon. Thank you very much for your time. Best success with all your projects. And uh, always enjoy having you on Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. It's always a pleasure to talk to both of you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Pleasure is all ours. And there you have it, my beloved truth seekers. Moon Laramie discussing his new book, Blavatsky Unveiled. As I mentioned in the intro, we had to cut it short due to scheduling issues. So this is the entire Lemurian enchilada. As a bonus, I'll include our interview with Gary Lachman on H.P. Blavatsky. The show complements Moon's interview real nice. Regardless, I hope you support this Red Pill Cafeteria if you find value in any of my content. Beyond full shows, keep in mind I've added in the last year Finding Hermes, short clip videos, more AB Live, 
and our virtual Alexandria private meetings. When all hell broke loose in the Black Iron Prison in 2020, I dedicated myself to push even harder to give you those contraband truths, build a Gnostic community that looked out for each other and the least of our brothers. I hope I have gotten close to accomplishing this. My mission is to inspire you to inspire others, as others inspired me in the past and continue to do so. We are all just points of light in an amazing journey, barring illumination from one another, in the darkness of mere being, here in the desert of the real. I'm only getting started, and so are you. How you play is what you win. Please keep in mind that I am offering voiceover services for any audiobook, podcast, commercial, narration project you might have. I've already done several audiobooks in 2020, like Concerto of the Rising Sun, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and The Odontiad as well as commercials for an alternative Christian project and some obscure brands. Also keep in mind, I want out of Illinois, and some of you have already provided great information. Thank you. But looking for the best option, so if the Aeons inspire you, let me know. Could be Uruguay even, could be Massachusetts, could be FN Lemuria. For patrons and AB Prime members, let us to our bonus with the marvelous Gary Lachman on H.P. Blavatsky. For the rest, thanks for spending a spell or two at the Virtual Alexandria. And hello and goodbye, as always. <laughs>